Okay, I just wanted to also just for practical details, uh, after um, Malak Helmi and Janine Armin uh, finish their performance, we're going for lunch and we'll be back at 1.45 for the third uh, block of the day. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Malak Helmi and Janine Armin. Um, Malak Helmi is a visual artist and Janine Armin is a writer and editor and together they form artistes to make love songs with Helmi on vocals and lyrics and um, Armin on electric guitar, uh, usually, but not today, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, as artistes, they have performed at the Salinas Archaeological Museum Palermo and Savi Contemporary Berlin, and most recently they performed at the Townhouse Gallery in Cairo, accompanied by DJ Ahmed Sami in a scenography uh, by Malak Helmi. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, yeah. Welcome. So, good morning, and uh, thank you, Hepatia, for inviting us um, to join this day. Thank you, Rinda and Jorit, um, for facilitating everything. Um, so, I actually would be great if we could just make the lights a bit brighter. Yeah, without spots. But yeah, that's okay. All right. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, we're we're not exactly doing a performance. We're really more talking about. I thought we um, uh, since you know, sort of thinking about how this day is structured and so on, sorry. Um, maybe it would be nice to sort of share um, like thinking processes and, um, you know, so Janine and I um, worked together on this project called uh, Artiste and to make these love songs, uh, you know, I, I don't really sing and uh, normally and uh, it was just exciting for me to do a project where I get to, um, spend time making music with a friend of mine. <laughs> and um, and uh, Janine also gets to, um, you know, uh, play the electric guitar. And so we've been doing this for the past um, a year, more or less, and, and the last um, month or so, we were spending some time um, sort of working towards making uh, this, this performance that was supposed to happen in the townhouse, but it didn't <laughs> um, because, um, because it's also, you know, often quite difficult uh, to put on, um, you know, projects in, uh, in art spaces of Cairo at times, you know, things are sort of shifting a lot. <laughs> but anyway, that's besides the point. Um, so I wanted to think um, a little bit about, um, yeah, our process and, and also the conversations that um, we were having back and forth with uh, Hepatia, um, thinking about this, um, this, day um, and sort of thinking about the invitation from Studium uh, General to enter the wild beyond. And um, so, so yeah, so I'll sort of share some of these thoughts and then we'll, you know, uh, we get somewhere hopefully. Um, so, so yeah, from that question of um, Studium General, which is sort of to enter the wild beyond, um, the question that came to mind immediately was, what is it that we want from wildness or being wild? Um, and, you know, in the introduction, you know, some people mentioned different things about that, but so there'll be some repetition. But to be wild in its most common uh, term, you know, understanding is to be untamed, um, sort of a quality produced in nature, uh, to be undomesticated. So if the wilderness is where wildness belongs, then the wilderness, um, like, like nature, um, is an imagined um, is imagined as a place, right? A location that you can go to, um, let's say, and even if it is beyond, um, you know, that beyond might sort of be a dimension or a place or something like that. Um, 
And then it is somewhat proposed um, that we want to, want to enter into that dimension of the wild. Um, this is sort of what I understood from the description of the day as well. So um, a place or a state in which we're closer to this untamed nature, where we're per perhaps more in touch with ourselves, um, or at least a place in which, um, as the statement suggests as well, um, we can find histories and stories radically discontinuous from the official and dominant narratives about our lives and living together. That was the quote from the day. Um, so, so my understanding from that is, you know, from the wild, we're trying to find a way out, right, of dominant narratives, and or at least some kind of liberating narrative um, from, you know, the current systems and structures of rule and so on. Um, so, yeah. To add, uh, yeah, from that, um, you know, sort of thinking about um, finding forms of escape also from acts of naming, from value systems of knowledge making and, um, you know, to shift our way of seeing, right? So I think this is what we're also trying to, to think of when we're thinking about the wild. Um, and then, you know, sort of the addition to that was also thinking about, you know, to be undomesticated is to be untethered to the rules of the home, right? And uh, by extension of that, to be untethered to uh, the dominating laws of a particular economy. Um, so, through these conversations that I was having back and forth with Hypatia as well, we were thinking about, um, you know, this notion of a wild, I, I, was, I was trying to understand it through um, Timothy Morton's notions on uh, ecology without nature. Um, and so, you know, uh, we'll just touch on that a little bit, but uh, before going there, I wanted to pick up on um, the end of the description um, from uh, Hepatia as well, where she says, um, she wanted to propose a forum like the Anarchy of Col Colored Girls assembled in a riotous manner so as to study how in a minor key, ungovernable excess swarms socially and wildly, uh, wildly disrupt and exceed um, ongoing colonizing inventions of the wild. So, yeah. And this is a little tete a tete. I am with, with Janine Armand because <laughs> we developed this as interlocutors, but um, just to continue off what Malik was saying, uh, from this I understand that we agree that the wild is an invention. As you say it is, much, much like, say, nature is an invention. I want to touch on this latter point with more clarity, but before doing so, I'd like to try to understand or establish that the vocabulary you are using, excess swarms wildly disrupting, being assembled in a riotous manner, is vocabulary used to invoke images of being together a terminology that suggests a bodily collective performativity, a minor key, like music, aeolian, so as to, su to suggest that you are looking to share a certain kind of bodily tactile knowledge that undoes by way of exceeding, shaking off, the potentially enclosing or colonizing nature of framing something as wild. So that I want to establish here is that we are first saying the wild is an invention of sorts but I'd like to clarify once more how I understand that. And then second that, even if we agree it is an invention, that the wild is an invention, we do know it is an idea or thing we are interested in, like nature is a thing we want to understand, whatever it is. And we want to approach it in such a way so as not to cage it. We want to approach it performatively, by way of its own form, which, if I am understanding your terms correctly, that form is excess and sensuality, as opposed to, say, theory. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's quite funny then that we're going to spend most of the time talking. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, somehow that, you know, that works that way sometimes. Um, so, um, yeah, I was sort of, again, sort of trying to understand this idea of excess and sensuality and so on, what that could be. And, um, so going back to 
to Morton's Ecology Without Nature as just a way in which to understand this, um, Morton suggests that the problem with ec ecological thinking is this very idea of nature. So it's this idea of nature um, as a thing over there that should be a particular natural way that we need to protect, and then we somehow fetishize it, that undoes ecological thinking. So you know, he, what he suggests is by eradicating the idea of nature altogether, uh, then you know, some kind of like a queer approach to thinking about ecology emerges, uh, in which we get to do away with our um, with identity and subject-object relations. Um, so what he says, nature, by definition, is an ether between things. Um, and the more we try to describe it, or our role in it, the more distant it becomes, the more we separate from it, uh, and all we see is you know, ourselves or the subject. So, um, so similarly, that notion of the wild, uh, the more you, know, you try to approach it, um, uh, the more it sort of gives you the slip. So, um, so yeah, we were thinking about this as well. Um, when sort of um, what Morton suggests is that, you know, an ecological writing is an ambient poetics in which the subject disappears and gets vibrated out um, by uh, sort of Alvin Nusse's I'm sitting in a room kind of frequencies. Um, so, you know, we're trying to think about what that sort of ecological thinking is. Um, and um, the you know ways in which of you know rethinking our, our worldview, um, but you know what often happens as well is when you try to you know change a worldview, um, you also sort of are um, sort of you you are stuck in a view, you're stuck in some kind of a, a, a dialectic of some kind. So um, so yeah, my understanding of you know again these the terms sort of excess and sensuality. Um, is um, is something that you're sort of doing, you know, formally, right? To sort of be in the body, uh, by way of yeah, ambient poetics. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. Maybe we should play a song. Um, well, I just wanted to, yeah, we could play that, um, but in a second. Oh yeah, that song, right? Okay. <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, what I wanted to get to most of all was sort of this point that we started off with, which is sort of thinking about, um, you know, this, 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 the wild, this sort of this place um, in which you uh, want to be, um, yeah, undomesticated. But I think what was coming up a lot of the time recently um, was thinking about, in fact, how you know, sometimes things are a little bit too wild. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and, and the world does feel a little bit wild and a bit difficult sometimes. And the thing that, you know, you are actually often trying to do is to just come back into yourself in a particular way, you know, to sort of hold a place in your body. Um, so, so we were thinking a lot about that time that we actually spend at home. And um, actually the, the process of domesticating you know, um, our, ourselves, and um, yeah, we can play a little bit from sort of spending time at home. Um, How do you call it? Drive? No. Um, yeah. So, hold on. So, so one of the things that I felt was um, most important to share um, was, you know, we're talking, we're going to get to this moment of sort of talking about avatars and cat dogs and um, these different sort of uh, images of the self, let's say. Um, but, oh, can we, uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, so, where are we? Where did we get to? Um, yeah, what I wanted to also talk about was, you know, when you're talking about this technology of self-improvement, of somehow going out into this wild and so on, um, maybe sometimes, you know, the most simple technology that you also need to think about is the technology that you also sort of learn from home, right? And from maybe spending time with 
with your pets. And I think this has been you know, one of the most interesting things that I've been having conversations about uh, with a lot of people. So a lot of the, the things that we're doing in Cairo, <laughs> in backstage behind people sort of doing projects and so on, is you know, mostly spending time with their cats and learning from their cats and, and their dogs, um, you know, how to actually be in their body. And so, um, yeah, so this is actually what I really wanted to talk about. <laughs> Somehow to sort of make, um, make a bridge back into, um, you know, how you actually get to learn to become, you know, human, actually. How to somehow learn to become, um, um, you know, the mother of, of cats. How to learn to sort of become calm. Um, how maybe not to constantly be sort of fragmenting into many different parts and many different people and, um, you know, getting sort of torn apart by, um, um, you know, in fact, what, all of that excess, you know, that's kind of happening uh, all of the time. And so, yeah, we, we're going to talk about my three cats, which are uh, Pandora and Orange and Billy. <laughs> well, I think also uh, during the preparation for this event, we were lost in the conceptualization of the wild and reading various texts. And then we looked at our, I guess, entourage, mm -hmm. which is here. Um, and then realized instead of conceptualizing something that isn't really a concept, mm -hmm. to instead do something with it. But I think it's also good to play some of the music that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're very helpful. So a lot of the time, exactly when we're working on something, we know it's good because you know one of the cats will come up to us and and namely Pandora. Pandora <laughs> is, is the one. Um, so, for example, um, you know, this is uh, one of the songs that, yeah, <laughs> Pandora really gets into. Um, why is it not playing? Is it connected? song that we worked with um, in uh, one of our performances and um, or at least we were inspired by it at some point or another. Janine was inspired by it somewhere or another. And um, yeah, and a lot of the time that we spent sort of working on the project had also to do with Pandora kind of, yeah, coming up and sitting on Janine's guitar. <laughs> yeah, she literally helped with the composition. Also with this there's a series of tracks that we were listening to and they ended up being formative for the project and yeah they all were coincident with reverb and pandora's enlightened reaction to it <laughs> that often i think humans don't have the same yeah i guess it's it's a different frequency mm -hmm. um yeah so this is one yeah one track that all three of them particularly liked mm -hmm. and yeah, and they kind of go around the house and um, and get you know extremely energetic, but um, yeah, I think it was actually really interesting. Also, sort of thinking about so like two of the the cats <laughs> that I take care of, you know, come from um, from the streets, and we sort of took them in. And one of them is uh, Orange, who ooh, maybe I can stop this one over here. Um, yeah, one of them is Orange, who is an extremely um, stressed out cat. 
And and I'm not I'm honestly not trying to sort of make fun by talking about my cats, or I don't think it's a ridiculous thing to talk about your cats because it's um, you know it's it's an important thing really to sort of spend some time thinking about how you learn from your pets, how to actually be in yourself, and how to sort of spend time at home and to sort of become comfortable in your body, which I think is a really really difficult thing, you know, and and how also to sort of watch them and watch how they might cuddle each other and, um, and how they cuddle you and how you actually get to learn, you know, maybe to be a little bit softer with people around you. And, you know, I think these are, when we talk about a lot of things like technology or avatars and all of that, um, you know, some, sometimes it's really these very, very simple things that are really teaching you an extremely profound technology, um, you know, which is just immediately in front of you. And, um, and I think it's very important to give that value. <laughs> yeah, and not, not to, because um, we're, I suppose, intentionally talking about home life and intentionally not politicizing, um, but some sometimes cats. you can't go out or sometimes, uh, yeah, <laughs> sometimes all you have as an audience is your cats because um, there are other systems of power in play, and to yeah to undermine them is to not uh, not retreat um, yeah not not even withdraw, but somehow uh, fall into an aporia that's made up of yeah different I guess different species something wild mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, and this is a situation which, for example, my cat Orange uh, was, you know, it was the first time she had figured out a way to sit on, sit on a ledge and have a nice time. Because she's normally extremely stressed out. Uh, she's a very, very wired cat. And, and then the two other cats eventually started to, well, that, that's not the right order, sorry. The two other cats started Look, she, she became very happy. <laughs> and then the two other cats started, sorry, to copy her and, and went up there and she completely changed um, as, as a character. And, um, um, and, and that really changed me <laughs> also. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, you know, I spend a lot of time sort of thinking about people and their cats and their dogs, because in Cairo as well, um, you know, there's, um, you know, yeah, like I was saying sort of at the beginning, like we were supposed to have this show at the townhouse, we didn't because, you know, the art scene is constantly sort of dealing with all kinds of problems, you know, people are being kicked out, people are, uh, you know, sort of funding is being shut down. You're constantly trying, having to move in different ways to sort of find the space to make work, right? And, um, and so what's come in that space is often, um, you know, music. Uh, a lot of people are making music. There's a lot of places where people go dancing and so on. But really, most of these people are spending time with their cats and their dogs as well. Um, and I really spend a lot of time sort of thinking about how, um, how, for example, how, how those companions, you know, like the, a three-legged dog of a friend of ours, you know, called Fulla, um, is, 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 is teaching, you know, sort of two people how to, um, how to take care of themselves better, you know? And um, they're, they're really taking care of themselves, whereas maybe a year ago, they were really breaking themselves apart and, and getting completely consumed by, uh, by way too much energy around you, you know? It's, it's a tough state, it's a tough country, you know? It's a tough situation. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> Those are some of the things that we wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, well, and Janine tells me that she sort of dreams of Pandora a lot as well. <laughs> Every night. <laughs> but um, yeah, I guess, and there's, when you are restricted to your home as your sphere of performance, your sphere of thought and it all kind of intermingles and these people become humanized or these, that's, yeah, that's a Freudian slip, these cats become humanized and you become cat-like and cats become dog-like and dog become, you know, become cats and people become cat dogs, dog cats and it's, you know, this sort of 
miasma, um, there's, you know, there's a number of sort of uh, convergences that begin to happen, especially in terms of like, yeah, Orange becoming an influencer. Mm -hmm. And that giving her some sort of power and for the first time understanding that in some sense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, did you want to play the song? Yeah? Okay. So during our um, anti, yeah, anti-performance period, <laughs> um, I spent a lot of time with the cats alone and um, prepared a number of songs for them. So we're going to play one. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's You are the dreamer, we are the scholars, we study what you know. Why won't they let me be free, if only? I don't want to die because I love you. Why won't you let me love you? We at you and the beauty grows. We look at you and it is on the nose. I don't want to die because I love you. Why won't you love you? If you set me free, we can be. If you can't set me free, you can trust me, and all the love will grow. As you can see, they're very inspiring creatures, <laughs> <laughs> but and the <laughs> and the frequency is not so pleasant for humans. But they really do it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, and. Exactly. And I mean, it was interesting sort of hearing your talk at the end because, you know, I mean, we're talking about maybe two different things, but the healing of the home, you know, and um, and it's, it's yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's just really important to talk about things very simply. Um, and yeah, because I think we're all spending time trying to heal ourselves <laughs> because things are too wild, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think... Um, yeah, the, the, the last one maybe I also um, wanted to share, um, which was, you know, sort of done by a friend of mine, and this isn't even, you know, his song. Um, it was, um, I was, you know, really stressed out, and I called my friend and I said, um, hey, can you tell me a story to sort of calm me down? And, um, and then he said, you know, I'm, um, I'm not good at coming up with stories on the fly, you know? And so I was like, okay, can you sing me a song? And, um, and so he did, and he sent me this recording of a song. And, um, and then I sang along to it a lot, and it really calmed me down. And I think that was, you know, really important for me. <laughs> so I was gonna play it, because he's also, uh, he's got a beautiful voice, so. It was also, you know, when recorded on his phone. <laughs> soul isn't right, and it's wrong a song by Blur. <laughs> it's in your hand. When the traces of dark come to fade in the light you're in safe heavy seas of love When the 